This is Thursday, July 23rd, 2015. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Edward Brennan Sr., better known as Ned. Welcome, Ned. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? December 23rd, 1923, and Moss Hospital, Natick. And what community do you currently reside? Framingham, Massachusetts. Your marital status? Two ch wife and two children. Do you have grandchildren? Yes. Two. Two. And tell us a bit about life in Natick growing up. Wonderful. And what was your, uh, what did your father do for a living? He was an attorney. And your mother? Housewife. And I understand you had brothers? Yes. <clears throat> Two brothers, John, mm -hmm. Richard, and a daughter, Sheila. And you went to Natick schools. You went to Natick schools? Oh, yes. Graduated Natick High School, June 14th, 1942, first Friday class. And of course, Natick High at the time was just across the street from where we're interviewing now. When you were uh, in, in school, uh, were you made aware of events happening in Europe and Asia before the war? Oh, yes. And do you remember what you were doing uh, when Pearl Harbor was invaded? I was at my aunt's house over on South Main Street, and she was hanging drapes, and I was helping her. And how did you hear about it, Pearl Harbor? The radio. Okay. Did your brothers enlist immediately? After that? They, they all enlisted. Hmm. John went into the Air Force, and Dick went back into the Marine Corps. But you stayed in school. I, yeah, I graduated in 42. Mm -hmm. But then, as I say, I went into the Navy in um, 46 and 43. And what, um, what drew you to the Navy? Pharmacist maid. Oh, I meant, well, why the Navy instead of... I love the ocean and the ships. So where and when did you join the military? In January. January, okay. In January of... Uh, 13th of 1943. And did you go to Boston? Boston, Federal Building. And aside from your brothers, did other family members or friends join the military when you did? A lot of them did. Lincoln Street was pretty empty. And that's where you resided? At right. The time. Okay. 13 mm -hmm. Lincoln. Where were you sent for basic training? The, the U.S. Naval <laughs> at St. Uh, let me see, the um, Navy Lakes Training Center in, in Chicago. Was this the first time you were away from Natick? Yes. And you were about, what, 18 at the time? 17, about that, 18? Yeah, about that. So tell us what BASIC was like. It was, two, it was uh, three months, and it was just too long. Cold as all get out. Green Bay, Wisconsin. Ooh. And it was cold. So you got to be in the frozen tundra of Green Bay. Green Bay. 
And what did you do in, free, in Green Bay besides freeze? Oh, we uh, read our Blue Jackets manual, and we went and saw pictures of various things that you do aboard ship and so forth. Other than that, there wasn't, there wasn't much. Did you have any additional training beyond basic? No, not there. Not there. All right, so you spent three months in Green Bay. Tell us what happened next. Well, then I was transferred. I put in for pharmacist mate. I was transferred to San Diego Naval Hospital. And we took care of all the patients coming back from the Pacific or Tell us a little more about what it took to be a pharmacist mate. Well, you, you need to, how to learn how to take shots and, and care for the sick and uh, work, with, work with the wounded. It was busy. Mm. These ships came in. We used to have to go down and help them off the ships and so forth, uh -huh. take them up to the hospital. And how big was the Naval Hospital? Oh, big. Beautiful. Did you work alone or did you have like nurses? No, I, I was with a doctor. Okay. And a nurse. I watched an eye operation one morning. It was great. An eye operate? As in? The, yeah, in the <laughs> operating room. So. Ross McIntyre was uh, FDR's physician, and he was there. And I did this thinking my friend was next to me, and I jabbed Ross. <laughs> he just laughed. How long were you stationed in San Diego? Oh, four months. And at the end of the four months, tell Well, then I, I get into the V-12 program. And we were, we were tra I was transferred to Colorado College in San Diego. And everything was going along fine. Then it became overcrowded. So they took all the Easterners and shipped us to Oberlin College in Ohio, which was great. Wonderful music, violins, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And why the V-12 program? They abolished it. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back to the fleet. And how long were you in Oberlin before the V-12 oh, program? about a month. About a month. And uh, they, they told me to, uh, to report to Norfolk, Virginia, because you were being assigned to a ship, DE-409, USS LaFraud. Mm -hmm. And DE is a destroyer escort? Right. Okay. And you were pharmacist mate. What was, what was your rank? At second, the, farmers made, second farmers Second farmers. Second class. Okay. So at the time you were assigned to Norfolk and assigned to the destroyer escort, uh, what time was this? Around uh, still 43, 44? That would be uh, 45, say 44. 44, okay. Because the ship was built in Houston, Brown Shipyards in Houston, Texas. And so it, you know, it, was, it was June of 44 that we christened it out in uh, Houston, Texas. So this was, um, you were assigned shortly after the invasion of Normandy, is that correct? Yes. Okay. After Normandy. So tell us what the life on a destroyer escort is like. Very, very busy. Mm -hmm. So your uh, farmer's mate, second class. Yes, oh. you, you, well, we had suture work to do, people cutting themselves, and uh, athletic feet problems and so forth, mm -hmm. and uh, homesick, and uh, they were always coming down to sick. We had a lot of southern people crew with us. And they were always coming down with stomach aches and everything else. So I said to the quartermaster, 
Can't you uh, find something that these people to do, even if it's just a scrape paint, get their minds off? Uh -huh. It worked. Okay. Was that the first time you were dealing with people from another part of the country? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, well, why, why, do you, why did you join the Navy? They said, we didn't. The, the Navy draft was too old. They threw us all into the Navy. Now, I shouldn't be telling you this, but we had people that couldn't read and write on a ship. They don't belong on a ship because you have four or five different responsibilities. One, one character was sick in the South South, and I took his mail over to him at the hospital. And he says, Doc, uh, I can't read. Would you read me my mother's letter? It's kind of embarrassing for me. It's good news, but. But payday, they would come down, the exec, he'd make an X, and the exec would sign under that, and they would, they would pay him. Mm -hmm. I have heard instances uh, where soldiers I and mean, sailors uh, would come in and be functionally illiterate. In fact, I think we had a previous uh, interviewer who part of her duties was to help them learn to read and write. Yeah. But not on a ship. Not on a ship. How long were you stationed in Norfolk? Oh, about a month. And tell us what happened next. Then after that, we went to uh, Brown Shipyards in Houston, Texas. And, uh, one of the officers, Brennan, see those four uh, freight cars out there? You empty them. We had to supply the ship. Uh huh. And what were the freight cars filled with? All medical. All medical. All medical. And I, I think they threw the liquor in too, mm -hmm. brandy and so forth. So what were you thinking when you were unloading four freight cars full of well, medical? We were living, we were uh, in barracks. Uh -huh. And then when the ship was commissioned, we moved aboard ship. <clears throat> What were you thinking when you were unloading all these supplies? You had a funny feeling about this? Well, of course, I thought that was all done for us. Uh -huh. I, I didn't realize we had to do it. Yeah. Okay. My chief officer's yeah. mate, Carol, he, uh, he was great. He, he, he was one. But some of the crew helped us, too. Mm -hmm. We didn't do it alone. And who was the name you just mentioned? Okay. Uh, Clayton Carroll, he's a chief pharmacist mate. Clayton Carroll. See, we had no doctor. There was one doctor assigned to three ships, and they would come and stay three or four days and go on to the next one. So you pretty much provided all the medical care. You're, you're right. What happens after Houston? If what? Well, first of all, how long was the ship stationed in Houston? Oh, as soon as it was commissioned, Mm -hmm. and, and supplied, we were down to Galveston, Texas to put the ammunition on. Did you have to load the ammunition? Oh, no, okay. No. <laughs> no touch. No and, touch. And then from Galveston, we went to um, Bermuda for a shakedown cruise two weeks. What was that like? It was wonderful. I mean, one of the one of the man, one of the guys that I, he couldn't read. They gave this an expression: "Throw the ladder over." Would you clamp it down, side of the ship. He picked it up and threw it over. Over some Bermuda, you can see the bottom. So they put a wrench, pulled it up, and so forth, and taught them how to do it. And then we had showers, which is wonderful. And uh, all of a sudden, we can't have showers anymore. They were washing the deck down in the afternoon with fresh water. They turned it on the wrong valves. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the fresh water was replaced, we were back to, on business again. And then we launched a torpedo. We had three torpedoes. And it went to the bottom. It didn't go anywhere. They brought it up. And it was a World War I torpedo. Uh-huh. <laughs> So that was the end of the torpedoes. 
Well, I mean, two weeks in Bermuda is not the worst oh, thing beautiful, to do. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. On the ship, where were uh, where were your quarters? Aft. Aft. And Clayton was forward. The ward room would be the operating room for him, and the sick bay was just for mm -hmm. <coughs> small things. Mm -hmm. Two weeks in Bermuda. Tell us what happened next. Well, we were there, and then <coughs> we uh, came up to Boston put the ship in dry dock, and I think they were making it all over. They were ripping out the fan tail and everything else, and putting in new compartments and so forth. Then we left Boston, and we went to um, San Diego. That's, that's the, the harbor for okay. destroyers and destroyer escorts. Boy, you're piling up miles. Then from there, <clears throat> we escorted a ship. Oh, probably that. We were escorting a ship out of Texas to uh, Panama. And we went through the Panama Canal to uh, San Diego. You're now in San Diego. I'm assuming now it's around mid to late 1944. Let's see my dad, San Diego. But I, I want to keep my taste straight. Okay. Seven twelve forty four. Okay, so July twelfth, nineteen forty four. You're in San Diego. Well, then um, Mr. Roosevelt was coming to visit to see uh, General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, and we were the outboard ship. And of course, you're supposed to be dressed up in your whites and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, we were still in dungarees loading stores again. And the Admiral came over. He hit the roof, because Franklin's on his way. And uh, they took another crew from another ship and lined up our port side. So he told us all go down below and stay there. So one of the engineers was down working, and he just thought it would uh, be nice if uh, he started working. Uh, so we, as we were waiting to greet the president, he released the smoke from the chimney, and the place was covered with soot and everything else. We didn't even see Franklin. Oh man! Everything was blacked out, and we didn't fit very well after that. The admiral would let us come in, store up, and get out. We <laughs> finally he was transferred so we could go back to Hawaii and have liberty. Oh, okay. I'm sorry you didn't get to see President Roosevelt. Well, of course, he's up on the bridge with his cape on. Uh-huh. <clears throat> so high up, no, you couldn't. I, of course, we were down below, we couldn't see him anyway. Yeah, well, but still. But Franklin, it wasn't a very good welcome for Franklin. Uh-huh. All righty. You're still in San Diego. Hopefully out of the doghouse by now. Yeah. Right. And then we, uh, from there, we went to, uh, where was it? We went to uh, Anahuichos, Marshall Islands. So you know, you're heading across the Pacific. What was that trip like? Go great. We did a lot of convoy duty, many tankers and so forth. We bring the, the ones that are low with oil in, and we take the empty ones out. Mm -hmm. Were you worried about um, enemy submarines at that point? Well, we we were on a uh, we were on a uh, where was it here? We, we were on an assignment uh, to track down submarines. 
And we all had to take a turn at that. And um, we didn't find any submarines. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of the ship destroyers that came back <laughs> uh, were pretty well banged up. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what was, why were they so banged up? Kamikaze planes and submarines. So now you know you're getting into the war. Right. All right, you're now in the Marshall Islands. Tell us well, what we did, we traveled, I mean, we traveled uh, Marshall Islands, Saipan, Guam, mm -hmm. back and forth, back and forth, and so forth. Now, Saipan and Guam uh, were just recaptured yeah, by right. Americans. Right. Did you have a chance to visit those islands? I oh. did, uh, no. No. Uh, I did in Saipan. I managed to grab a Jap helmet and take it home, make a uh, plant, planter out of it. Do you still have it? <laughs> no, I gave it to a friend of mine. Okay. During your time when you were kind of traveling around the country and now in the Pacific, what was the best way you obtained updates about the war? Well, we had radio. And we had a paper called the Fantail News. It came out once a week. So they kept us up to date on what was going on. And of course, you, you heard about updates. Uh, Saipan was taken, Guam was taken. Right. Uh, you did get to visit Saipan. Uh, and I take it you were also being kept very busy as a pharmacist mate. Did you? Uh, treat any battle casualties or was it no, pretty much routine? No. Yeah. Okay. Normally when we got there it was all over. Uh-huh. So tell us some of, about some of the other places uh, your ship paid a visit to. Well coming from coming from uh, Saipan mm -hmm. um, we um, I get ahead of, my, ahead of myself here. That's okay. In, uh, in October of 45, uh, we were coming back from Nagasaki, I mean from uh, Sasebo, Japan. We had taken it over. And there were soldiers there that had enough points to go home. So mm -hmm. we had to go over and pick them up and uh, take them back to Okinawa. And that's when we, uh, we hit this typhoon. We, we, were, we were, it says here, describe the ter terrain you were in. I said, on the ocean and seven typhoons. Seven typhoons, wow. Tell us what going through a typhoon was like. Oh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's like you're down in the Grand Canyon and the 75 foot wave going over. But uh, that was, uh, the, men, the men that were bringing out army, they were all seasick. When they, when they got to Okinawa, they said they were going to walk home. <laughs> Can you blame them? No. So um, I went out on the deck one day, as long as it wasn't raining, but, but the waves were busy. And I had to take a, the, one guy was sick, so I had to take a, they call it the binnacle list up in the bridge and put him off duty for that day. And I was up on the bridge. And there was a five inch gun mount on the bow. All of a sudden, that just disappeared. And you wonder, it, it wasn't coming up. And finally, it arrived. <laughs> well, see, we, we, were, we weren't top heavy at all. So we just tossed back and forth for around 24 hours. Then we managed to get out of it, back to Okinawa.
Let's, uh, let's kind of dwell on Okinawa for a moment. If memory serves me right, wasn't that the, like the last major battle of the Pacific Theater? Yes. Yes. And what, what, what was the stories you've been hearing about? Well, at nighttime in New Jersey, each ship had their own movie projectile. So everybody was up above on deck watch, watching the movie. And they have the latest battleships and everything. There's a picture right in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, a kamikaze snuck in and, and landed on the uh, fan tail of one of the big carriers. And I'm telling you, all hell broke loose. But say we're going, we were, we were on the invasion of Okinawa, we went early. We were um, protecting the tankers. Mm -hmm. And then we, then after that, we went to. Uh, it says here, uh, Rebel experience, and I said it was. Uh, doing Nagasaki after the atomic bomb. That was terrible to see what happened there. Mm -hmm. And um, the typhoon was 24 hours. And also, uh, we picked up a PA, PBM plane had gone down in that area. So we picked up five survivors and transferred them to another ship so they could uh, mm -hmm continue their journey. Okay, let's, uh, let's get into a couple more details about Okinawa, and then we can talk a little more about the well, atomic... Well, the, the, uh, the, the typhoon, the big uh -huh. one, yeah. there were 65 ships lost mm -hmm. in, in Buckner Bay. They either turned over or thrown up on the shore because that's all coral out that way. Uh -huh. And was this on Okinawa or another part of the Pacific? No, uh, the harbor itself. The harbor itself, okay. And when did this typhoon hit? That was in, uh, let's see, typhoon. I, that, that, was, that was in October of, uh, we were coming back from uh, mm -hmm. Saipan. It was in October of '44. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, during the spring of '45, when you're still kind of out there in the Pacific, did you hear the news about victory in Europe? Yes. And you heard about the death of President Roosevelt yes. that happened a month oh, earlier. Yes. What was that like? Uh, well, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, Franklin's son, he was, he was, it was a destroyer next to us, and he, his son was the captain of that. No kidding. You know? uh, which son was that, Elliot? Elliot. Oh, okay. The, the, yeah, Elliot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the radio and the Fantail News kept us up to date on what was going on. Okay. And then August 45, you hear about something that was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki called an atomic bomb. Did you ever hear of the term atomic bomb before it was dropped. No. No. Not until, not until we saw Nagasaki. Uh huh. And I take you were offshore at the time. Oh, no. Nagasaki, they wouldn't let us off the ship. Uh huh. What I don't understand, uh, we're in there, and all of a sudden, all these crates of China, vases, and everything else arrived, so we could take it home. Well, I'm thinking, I was talking about radiation and so forth, you know. Great so I got three or four of things I brought home. It's very Small strange. bases yeah. and so forth, yeah. It's 
strange souvenirs. That's right. Mm. A few weeks later, I believe it was September 2nd, the formal uh, declaration was signed. Do you remember where you were when that happened? Uh, we were in Okinawa. Okay, back at Okinawa. Yeah. We spent a lot of time in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And did you hear about what the Japanese were doing to the civilian population? Yes. It'll be on the radio. Uh -huh. not, not much detail on that, though. Yeah. And what the Japanese were telling the civilian population to do, and to commit suicide rather than be right. beaten and raped yeah. by American forces. Well, those uh, kamikai finds, uh -huh. they always hit it for the bridge of a ship, throw everything off, you know. Uh -huh. All right, I think that now brings us to 45. You were back in Japan, picking up soldiers, dealing with a typhoon. And then on, on uh, we used to go to Ulithi, we used to go to the Caroline Islands. Uh -huh. That's for uh, recreation, four cans of beer and a football. And you could uh, stay there three, four hours, and another group would come aboard, and we'd have to go back to the ship. Any other recreational opportunities? When, when they came. Okay. Most of the time we were at uh, Mog Mog, that's part of Ulithi, for football and four beers. Now, I heard from some other interviews that when they got the four beers, some, some people would often trade the beers uh, for an upgrade to a bottle of whiskey. Did uh, you ever hear of that? Well, of course, uh, we had 190 proof ethyl alcohol. That's to make medications and so forth. And uh, so they thought on one of these things, four cans of beer, I said, well, I'm sick of beer, so they thought it was crazy. I was trading the four beers for four bottles of Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. And of course, the 190 proof came in handy. And when I got back to the ship, they could understand how I was having such a great time with four cans of beer. <laughs> it was an advantage being a pharmacist, mate, oh, wasn't it was there? Great. great. They had coconut, hey, a little nip of, I'll make sure you get a good steak tonight, all this business. You know. But then after the time, the time fooled with my saving grace because I had to account for all this alcohol and, and brandy and so forth. It was so hot out there that I slept on, a, on an ammunition trunk up in the main deck. And the ointments, you could drink the ointments, it was so hot. Well then, after the typhoon, there must have been maybe four or five cans that were missing. So I said, well, the officer was right there, I opened the safe, and we checked the brand, he never opened. There were four, two ounces, of about six, six bottles to a package, all dried up from the heat, the skin. Uh -huh. But it, uh, I mean, oh, the reason, uh, the alcohol, I said, well, you know, during the typhoon, we lost a lot of alcohol. They were on the rafts. Of course, they weren't. Mm -hmm. But that got me out of it. Don't put that down. Mm -hmm. I'll say, yes, we lost a, we uh, cracked our mass, and I think we lost, we did lose a lot of life rafts. Uh -huh. But they came in very handy for the ethyl alcohol. Okay, so post-typhoon, uh, the war is pretty much over. Tell us what happened next. Well, then, then uh, you have another thing here. Uh, where is it here? A memorable character. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, 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 my executive officer, his name is Ramon Connecticut Royster. And his mother named her sons after states. He's a very nice guy. He, uh, 
he was a, uh, he finally wound up editor of Wall Street Journal. He used to call him the little rooster, small guy. Very, very nice. I said to him one day, he was out roaming around, we started talking, I said, all these ships are out there getting ready for the invasion of Okinawa. I said, uh, sir, when can I take the uh, exam for first class? He says, Brian, see all those ships out there? They're holding you up, taking the exam. I said, well, then why don't you send me home? He started laughing and he took off. <laughs> Did you ever take the exam for first class? No, the war ended. Ah. So now it's uh, late fall 45. Yeah, when did you get to go home? Uh, I got home. Let's see. I was just charged in Boston. February 8th of 46. And I, w I was working in Martin, Zell Martin Zell's office here selling real estate and so forth. So my brother called me, he said, are you sitting down? I said, why? He says, uh, Uncle Sam wants you for the Korean law. So that was from February of 51 through June of 52. There was some commander there. There was a house on the lake he wanted, and I didn't. T I didn't say anything to him. Someone told him I was going back into service. He said, "You get me that house. I'll push you anywhere you want to go." Mm -hmm. Well, somebody in the family bought the house. I said, "Well," said, "Well, what do you want to do?" I said, "Well, listen. I have a son, a brother in Korea now, and another brother out in Texas getting ready to fly B 29s Oh, how about Quonset Point where I said fine. So, would, you so I ran, we ran the blood bank down there. Mm -hmm. And then one week one weekend a month, I had to go down on the landing strip. They put you in this room from four o'clock in the afternoon Friday and you don't leave until eight o'clock Monday morning in case something happens. You have to be there for the the plane crashes and so forth, which I didn't have any. Mm -hmm. And where was this again? Quonset Point. Quonset Point. Yeah. They make submarines down there now. And where exactly is Quonset Point? Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Okay, thank you. So let's go back a little bit to uh, post-World War II, but pre-Korean War. You're working in the real estate office with uh, Mr. Serrell. And Natick is about, the area is about to get into a very interesting period known as the baby boom. Right. Uh, do you remember what areas of town in Natick and Framingham uh, kind of changed well, dramatically? Several uh, merged with uh, the, um, who were the brothers that built? Campanelli Brothers, uh -huh. they owned all that land. All that land, I was a millionaire, single and edict. Every time Cyril bought land, he put it in my name. It's too bad I didn't get married, I'd be wealthy today. Oh. <laughs> and all that land, that's for Weathersfield 1, Weathersfield 2, all the way up to Framingham and so forth. And then there were two banks, First Federal Savings and Chowtown Savings Bank did all the financing on those two projects. Then he was spread up in the north. He went all over the place. So that's that's where I had to leave that <clears throat> until I could get back again. Then when I came back, I went into banking. And this is uh, after Korea. After Korea. After Korea. And uh, when you were down at Quonset, was this, uh, were you still Navy or Army? Oh, no, Navy. You're still Navy, okay. Oh, no, I wouldn't leave the Navy. And were you still pharmacist mate second? Yes. Okay. Yep. So after Korea, you went into banking. And by the way, did you uh, go to school after the war? I went to that business college in Boston. 
And I took courses at Northeastern and for um, real estate. And did you uh, go on the GI Bill? GI okay. and GI insurance. And when you left the, ser um, the service, did you join any military service organizations? I made sure I didn't. You didn't? Okay. Oh, well, I mean, the reason uh -huh. was they told us that in case of war, the reserves would go first, the inactive wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Well, Henry just reversed it, Harry Truman. He took the inactive in, and the reserves stayed home. Uh -huh. That didn't go down very well. Oh, what about um, service posts like the Legion, the FDA? Oh, yeah, yeah, I joined the, uh, where is it here? I think I was in the Legion for around 10 years. Let me see, I, I have a, <laughs> I think I did. Yeah. Oh. I think that's out of Washington. Sergeant Elvin C. York of Tennessee. Then we had a first reunion up here in Danvers, Massachusetts. Went over very well. So uh, they kept saying to me, hey, Doc, did you ever follow uh, your profession there? I said, yes, I'm a brain surgeon. <laughs> hey, that's great. My wife stepped in. He's in banking. Don't pay any attention to him. <laughs> so you stayed in banking instead of going to brain surgery. And uh, where did you work? Uh, well, in the banks. Mm -hmm. I worked for uh, First Federal Savings and Loan. And, uh, and helping the child's town. When they came out here with their bankers, we used to have to go around with them while releasing the money. It would be the child's town savings bank one week and First Federal Savings and Loan the second week. So we kept busy loaning out money. Like I said, interesting period. And let's, um, let's talk a little bit more about your brothers. I know you said one was in the Marines. Well, John, brother John was in uh, Princeton. I said he left Princeton, and he went out to uh, Texas to learn how to fly B-29s. And, and, and Richard, uh, Dick, he was in the Marine, he was called back, and he was, I always said, you put your hand up, he, he was shot in the wrist out in Korea. He was on a hospital ship coming home, and the plane was hit by lightning, but it didn't, it didn't come down, he managed to stay up. So uh, that was his career. Then, then they, they went back to college and finished, and, went on to different things. I'm glad to see to hear they both got out okay. Yeah, oh, they did. Yeah. Well, no, well, John, we didn't discuss the war at all because John never left Texas. He had nothing to, nothing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you get married? Uh, August 12th of 1961. And you have to have two kids. Did either, um, did either child join the military or thought about it? The what? Did either child join the military? No. No, okay. I mean, they're, they're on the children. They're only, uh, what, 11 and 15. Mm -hmm. We haven't joined yet. Ned, how important was it for you to serve in the military? I had a good answer for that. So 
है ये I appreciate more of my family and friends. That is a good answer. And do you have any advice for anyone who's considering going into the military? Of course, I'd always say the Navy. Mm-hmm. Why dig ditches where you can have a nice, clean bunk and everything else? Ned, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up this interview? Well, I have something to say here that, uh, where was it here? Uh, the officer and crew of the Ursula Pride, uh, they were great to work with. Uh, the USS Pride, USS Pride uh, was sold for scrap in 1979, and you can put razor blades after that. I think Gillette cleaned up. Mm -hmm. But it was a great crew, very mm -hmm. lucky. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with them? Some of them. Some of them, okay. A lot of them had athlete feet, and I used to treat them. And so when they get back into civilian life, because they went to the VA, well, they wanted proof, so I wrote letters to every one of them, and they very well cared for. Mm -hmm. Ned, anything else? No, I think that's it. Okay. Well, Ned Brennan, we thank you so much for coming in and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. It was, a, I'm glad, I, could, I wish I had done it a long time ago.